Hey, Jeff and Cole here from the Triart Academy Podcast, letting you know that this episode is brought to you by Rogue Knights Gaming, located in Kaiser, Oregon. Come play with us in one of our three family-friendly seating areas, and while you're here, load up your arsenal with the latest and greatest Magic the Gathering singles, D&D products, board games, and much more. So come on in. Plenty of tables, plenty of space, and a selection of cards that are only surpassed by their down-home family customer service. Rogue Knights Gaming! Heroes Wanted. Apply Within. And this is Jeff. Welcome on in to another episode of the Triad Academy podcast, where it's always better to get good rather than get wrecked. And in this episode, we'll be examining an archetype that's been making the rounds in some CDH circles, both online and in person, ever since Ravnica Allegiance. To some, this nice young lady may be full of idealism. To others, she's been called the second coming of Gaddic T. Uh, if you're the kind of person who's all about the facts, while forcing your opponents to bend to your will, then this spry young idealist is right up your alley. Enter Lavinia and Zerus Renegade, a woman with a stiff backhand and a hard-on for enforcing the law. Do you love cops? Do you enjoy enforcing the law? Do you desire to make wrongdoers shiver in your presence? If you do, stick around. Let's first bring up the Queen of Clean and take a closer look at what Lavinia can do. Whoa, a new toy! Can I play? So Lavinia Azorius Renegade costs just an Azorius, a white and a blue. She's a legendary human creature, a human soldier specifically, uh, and is a 2-2 with the following abilities. Each opponent can't cast non-creature spells with converted mana cost greater than the number of lands that that player controls. Also, whenever an opponent casts a spell, if no mana was spent to cast it, counter that spell. So upon closer inspection, we see that this hate bear is centrally focused around two elements of control. One is the number of lands that each opponent individually has, and the other is whether or not mana was used to cast any spell. To play to this hate bear's utmost effectiveness, that means we're going to concentrate around her two specific themes. The first theme we'll be focusing on is mass land destruction via Armageddon effects. This is because even though creatures can't be prevented by her first ability, some of the best non-creature spells in CDH are either free or very cheap to play. Red alert. Red alert. Red alert. You crossed my line of debt! You haven't dismantled your MX stockpile. Pakistan is threatening my border! That's it, Buster. No more military aid. <laughs> Nuke em. Get them before they get you. Another quality home game from Butler Brothers. We're talking about not just fast mana rocks, but also free counter spells. Depriving resources in this matter cuts off cards that your opponents can't make use of, which kind of turns her into a one-sided defense grid. The second is setting up lockout situations where any spell that's cast for free by an opponent is automatically countered. The best way to ensure that this happens is to make use of cards that drive the game state toward this kind of effect in order for it to happen. In turn, that means we're going to be leaning on two to three specific cards depending on how you choose to build her. Those cards, in no particular order of importance, are Knowledge Pool, Omen Machine, and Dream Halls. By forcing people to play cards for free, or by giving them the option to play them for free in the case of Dream Halls, we force our opponents into a corner where they can't act profitably again. Against us. I like it! Now you may be wondering to yourself, well, Lavinia sounds cool and all, but why not just play Grand Arbiter instead? That's a reasonable question. Let's discuss that. 
Many people who go down the route of blue-white control generally tend to veer more towards the stack's archetype at higher levels of commander play. Naturally, Grand Arbiter lends himself to the stack's archetype because of his inherent cost reduction abilities while at the same time taxing your opponents. And while both archetypes share very similar card choices, depending on how a deck is built for its meta, it ultimately comes down to the difference in both deck building and piloting philosophies in Sasisic. In specific, when you play Gave, you ideally want to tax your opponents into poverty just like a corrupt politician. In contrast, Lavinia wants to prevent things from happening altogether. Think of it in an analogous manner as a difference between stranglehold and sphere of resistance. One wants to extort a bribe from you, and the other just wants to haul you off to jail. Furthermore, Gabe's effectiveness is usually more geared towards slow, grinding metas where it can gradually gain value over its opponents over time. Lavinia, however, is much more effective overall due to her strong abilities and low casting cost, as well as her early game explosiveness. Speaking of low casting costs, Lavinia is a lot easier to bring onto the battlefield, and acts as a lock piece, opposed to Gov, who is a cost inhibitor. While this is fairly obvious, it bears mentioning you can expect people to try and remove your commander. And when that happens, recasting Lavinia is going to be a lot easier than Gov. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into the game plan. The game plan for this deck is fairly straightforward. Resolve our commander as early as possible, preferably no later than the end of turn one, and then begin to control the game from there, eventually either building up to a hard lockout or to a win condition. In the process of progressing towards the eventual lockout, we will be dropping an assortment of stack pieces onto the field and treating them like landmines for our opponents to navigate through. Some of the stack pieces we'll be relying on involve the old tried and true, such as Winter Orb, Curse Totem, Graft Digger's Cage, Rest in Peace, Stasis, and so forth. Unlike more mainstream versions of this archetype, however, we will also be making use of cost reduction effects like Helm of Awakening in order to cheapen the cost of colorless cards played, while at the same time making those cards nearly uncastable for our opponents. Lavinia, by proxy, turns cards like Helm of Awakening into a one-sided fear of resistance because of how she's worded. Now, in some variants of the La Lavinia Omen Pool archetype that we have personally seen in person, cards like Rising Waters, Overburden, Storm Cauldron, and Sunder may make an appearance due to how they affect lands. Do not be surprised if they make an appearance against you in your games. This also includes cards like Mana Vortex and Mana Breach, which also affect lands. When it comes to Meddling Mage and other nevermore styled effects, it's usually a good call to isolate problematic commanders that are in the command zone especially if that player is reliant on their commander or if there's more than one player playing the same commander. When facing down decks with black in them, it's usually a decent idea to call up Demonic Consultation and or Tainted Pack in order to shut those cards down, especially if you sense that they're playing Thassa's Oracle based on their commander choice. Finally, in order to really throw our weight around the table harder than Captain Harris bossing around Lieutenant Proctor, we've incorporated the Torpor Orb Suite to round out our hate package. This means Torpor Orb, Hushwing Griff, Takatli Arnaguard, and Hushbringer are all going to make an appearance here. Their inclusion has been done for two reasons. The first reason is that this allows us to shut down enter the battlefield effects, which are fairly common in Commander normally. However, with the emergence of Thassa's Oracle in CDH, and more specifically consultation decks in general, we have determined that this is going to be of vital importance going forward. The second reason we have done this is because none of the creatures on our list haven't entered the battlefield ability, which means that we're not going to be affected in any way by the inclusion of these pieces. Once we have Lavinia in place and the board fairly stacked out, 
Then we're going to proceed to phase two, which is where the actual lockout takes place. Going for the hard lockout is generally going to come down to our ability to time and read the board. Waiting for the right time to either tutor or cast the lock, needless to say, is imperative. Ideally, you'll want to wait till your opponents are either tapped out or low on cards before searching for the lockout or attempting the lockout. Protecting Lavinia in the meantime is vital as she hinders the casting of free counter spells. Paired with Omen Machine and Knowledge Pool specifically are cards like Dranith Magistrate and Teferi Mage of Zalfir, which each prevent your opponents from casting spells in some form or manner. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. Dream Halls is a bit trickier of a card to maneuver with as the only card that in your deck prevents your opponents from free casting anything is your commander herself. These stacks pieces, while great in their own right, are generally, however, not enough usually to prevent you from getting beaten in the face with other beat sticks from your opponent. To that end, we've included a creature suite to augment our lockdown plan to include other notable hate bearers such as Alms Collector, Containment Priest, Danilith Magistrate, Linvala, Keeper of Silence, Teferi, Mages All Fear, Voidstone Gargoyle, and others. We want our opponents at the end of the day to feel like life is a disease, clinging to you and strangling your will to live. Once we've set the tone, it's time to move on to the end game. As with any stacks deck, a deck cannot just sit there and do absolutely nothing. We have to have and or have to find a way to win the game at some point. And this brings us to phase three, our end game. Generally, we want to stick a one-card win con or a two-card combo in order to promote slot efficiency. To that end, rest in peace, Helmville Obedience combo is our primary go-to. However, though, it's not the only way we can win. Other ways we can shatter our opponents with can include Darksteel Reactor, Approach of the Second Sun. However, though, in keeping with the MLD plan, it's also reasonable to pair a solid Planeswalker with your MLD spells. We suggest using Planeswalkers like Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, Vinzer, the Subjourner, or Jace, the Mind Sculptor, as these will force your opponents into submission. Regardless of any win condition you choose, make sure to only drop these win conditions onto the field when you can be certain that your pathway to victory is clear. With that said, let's move on to our starting seven. Opening hands usually revolve around any combination of relevant hate pieces, ramp, and interaction. This means that for your starting seven, your hand should include two to three lands, one to two pieces of artifact ramp, some interaction, and a tutor. Since we are playing for the long game, having the win immediately accessible isn't going to exactly pan out for us in the short term. So if you have a lock piece in your starting seven, feel free to ship it back. Opening hands and early game draw spells will be a good indication of what avenue you should pursue for the win. Now, before we get into any of the deck's specific weaknesses, be on the lookout for cards like Abrupt Decay, Vexing Shusher, and Buzeju, who shelters all. These kinds of cards in particular will wreck your lockout. Along these lines, any card that explicitly states that it cannot be countered must be dealt with immediately in order to prevent long-term damage to our game plan. Therefore, if you play in a meta that involves cards that favor these types of cards, then running cards like Mind Break Trap and Summary Dismissal may be relevant meta calls. With that piece of housekeeping out of the way, let's get into some of the more specific weaknesses of the archetype, starting with midrange. Midrange decks like Yeast on Midrange can be problematic if they get off the ground. Unfortunately for us, this is going to be one of the situations where getting a turn 1, turn 2 Lavinia isn't going to help you out much against them. Instead, you're going to want to track down a curse tome faster than a cop at a donut convention. In the case of Yeast on Midrange, hitting their creature activated abilities will be very debilitating for them. Be on the lookout for both 
a null rod, and a collector oath with this deck, as they're both guaranteed to make an appearance here. Along with that line of thought, Blood Pod variants are also potentially problematic since they rely on combat damage and Kiki Jiki combos to win. If we don't keep them in check quickly, things will get out of hand. To that end, Graph Digger's Cage will shut down their reanimator subplan. With regards to Najila Tempo, do not let Najila resolve where possible and remove her immediately if she does hit the field. You can block some of her attacks with the creature plan that we have set up for our variation of the deck, however, that's not where we want to be. All in all, any creature-centric deck that's combat damage focused is going to be a problem for us. This includes Harvest Animar, which is exclusively a creature-centric combo deck. Save your board wipes for these kinds of decks as things will get a bit hairy around them. Finally, on this topic, find your Helm Rip combo quickly and take these problematic decks out of the equation. The sooner you do, the better off you'll be. A glaring weakness of the Azarius color scheme is the lack of one and two card win cons. There are a couple afforded to the scheme, mainly Helm of Obedience, Rest in Peace, Dark Steel Reactor, and Approach to the Second Sun, but they are either costly or take quite a bit of time to get off the ground. Without a way to lock the game down first, getting to the win could prove to be very problematic. Non-basic land hate can be an issue for us, and that's why countermeasures in this respect are taken into consideration. An ounce of prevention, namely counterspells, chain of vapor, and cyclonic rift, is worth a pound of cure for us. But of special mention is humility. We cannot let humility resolve as a sizable portion of our lockout scheme is creature-oriented. A weakness that may not be apparent at first, but will ultimately reveal itself during the course of gameplay, is the onus of interaction. Once you land a lock place, or a lockout combo, the burden of interaction will almost squarely be placed upon your shoulders. This means that if you're not able to find a game-winning combo quickly, your lock will eventually be broken and you will get hosed. Additionally, since you're playing blue-white control, there's already a higher chance of likelihood that the burden of interaction will be placed upon you more often than not. Bear this in mind when you pilot this archetype. Yeah, the last thing you want is to get caught flat-footed like a keystone cop. Lavinia is a fairly respectable commander that is fairly decent at slowing down and punishing many of the meta's most aggressive combo decks, such as Hulk variants, Divergent Control variants, and Consultation variants. And due to Blue's inherent ability to find artifacts fairly easily, she makes for a one-two punch that can force a lockout if opponents aren't prepared to deal with her. Going forward, we expect to see her surface from time to time and harass her opponents quicker than you can get a ticket for jaywalking. At this time, we'd like to acknowledge Saper Suvant, Callahan is here, and Phoenix 15 for some of the pioneers of the Lavinia Omen Pool archetype. We have included their respective lists along with Jeff's list in the description section of this video. Now that's all the time that we have for this episode of the Triart Academy podcast. If you like this episode and would like to see or hear more content like this, feel free to like, share, and subscribe for further content. And as always, it's, it's always, always better, better to get, get good rather than get wrecked. <laughs> good night, sweet prince. <laughs> hey, wait up!